Eric's talk is about uh, recovering Grand Canyon's brightest botanical jewel, which is Century Nut Veg. And I definitely would not have a lot of tonight's presentation without all of the amazing work of my just finished two years with us as a Student Conservation Association intern, Emily Douglas. Um, she's a great photographer and she's a great botanist and she's really done a huge contribution to um, work with the species. So tonight is dedicated to Emily, who has just had a baby. So um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Grand Canyon National Parks, but I have the good fortune of working um, for the vegetation team. So. Martha is our big leader, Jane Rogers sitting here in the headwing section is our second leader, and um, Lauren McCarrick on the um, right hand side over there is my supervisor um, and has been with the vegetation program now for about, I think 15 or more years, but it's a great group of people um, totally devoted to their work recovering and um, taking care of the botanic resource of the canyon. Um, the plant we're going to talk about tonight is Grand Canyon National Park's only endangered plant species. It's called Century Milk Fetch. Um, it's a little mat forming perennial, and you can see from the size of the quarter there, they're quite small. A big Century Milk Fetch is probably about as big as your hand if you put it out flat on the ground. Um, in both size and height, and that could be 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 years old. And a little one, we'll see later on, but a little one is very, very teeny. When they first come up, the seed leaves are about a sixteenth of an inch across. Um, the name, Astragalus criminophylax, criminophylax means sentry or watchman of the gorge. And it gets that name because of where it grows. Um, which is in the Pinyon Juniper Woodland, which is pretty much the dominant plant community along the south rim of the canyon. Um, and it has some of the typical adaptations for that plant community, one being short plants close to the ground, small needles or small leaves, and also a gray or light white color, a lot of hairs on the leaves and things to help reflect the sunlight. So the plant is more drought tolerant than it could be um, if it weren't small and white and hairy. Um, within the pinion juniper woodland, though, it has a really special niche. So it grows on, on limestone platforms in the Kaibab limestone and um, also in crumbled limestone areas. Um, and you can see it grows very, very close from the edge. About the, um, the close farthest I've ever seen a plant from the edge is probably about 40 or 50 feet. And usually they're within you know, 10, 15 feet of the edge or even right on it. Um, unlike some of the other plants that grow on the limestone, though, they don't put on the side of it all. They sit up on the top. You never see them growing on um, vertical surfaces. They're always on horizontal surfaces. Um, another unique thing about the place they grow is that this special limestone habitat tends to have its own suite of plant species. And um, one of the most dominant ones is the little lavender leaf sun drops. You see it here with the four petal flower. It's related to an evening primrose, and it blooms pretty much huh, most of the summer. It'll probably start now in a couple of weeks and, and go to September or so. Um, we're going to do an experiment this year to see how this plant relates to the um, lavender leaf sun drops. Um, it could be a plant that it's frequently found right like you see in this picture. They're growing right next to each other. And so we think that it might be a good nurse plant for the species. So um, I'll show you what we're going to be doing in a little bit. And this is going to be a plant that will grow together and see if it's a good companion for trying to get this little milk fetch established in the wild. Um, there's some other plants in the community too. Um, this is James's Golden Buckwheat. And it's a little gnat forming plant too. Um, frequently you find it and you are in this rare plant community so that a lot of them grow together, which makes it a little easier than it might be if you're out surveying for plants in a really big area. Um, Drummond's Pennyroyal is a little plant in the mint family. All of these plants are usually less than six inches tall. Some of them can be up to about a foot across. 
but it's a really small plant community and everything in it has a little stature. Um, there's also a common milk vetch called Astragalus calicosis, Tori's milk vetch, and it tends to grow in the places in the habitat where sentry milk vetch does not. And usually there's a really clear demarcation between this plant and sentry milk vetch. It's another small plant, and at first when you're going out there trying to learn your sentry milk vetch, you'll find it and go, oh, this must be it, it's small. But these, well, this plant has leaves that are usually about a quarter inch or so long, so it's small, but the leaflets on sentry milk vetch will sometimes be a sixteenth of an inch or even smaller. So once you see the little one, then you realize that this common one just really isn't as small as you think it is in the beginning. Um, there are also some little spiny cushion plants in the community. This one is mountain phlox, um, and it's just another common companion. Um, a lot of times we go out and survey, and I'll show you some pictures of the rim, but one of the common features we've found in almost all of the areas where this milk vetch grows is that the particular outcroppings that have sentry milk vetch will often, almost always, have Utah agave. And so that's another help when you're trying to look. And it's so small and you're trying to find where it is, is if you see Utah agaves frequently when you go there, they'll be next to this plant. And then more common, um, something like the banana yucca, that all of the plants in the community tend to be a little bit smaller than you might find them if they were growing in something other than very, very shallow soil, a top kind of limestone. Um, and then one more, um, Escoberia vivipara is the Arizona beehive cactus. This is a really pretty little plant. Um, one of these single columns like you see here, this one's probably about two or three inches high and four inches across. Sometimes there'll be a whole little mound of them. But once again, they're very slow growing and very low to the ground. And in, you'll just go out and survey around for the milk veg. And this one, it's kind of funny, it's kind of sad. You go out there and you'll find them all kicked over because they're so shallowly rooted it looks like the elk probably try to eat them and don't like all of the thorns in their mouth and just spit them back out and move on. You'll just find like it looks like some giant came and ripped them all out of the ground. Um, now rock mat is another interesting companion species. Rock mat is always limited to growing on limestone and it's really common through the west and, and even um, up into places like Nebraska and Kansas there's rock mat growing on limestone soils. Um, you can see in this picture the rock mat has the kind of purpley green leaves and the milk vetch. You can see there are a couple separate ones here. Oops. So let me get this point back. All right. So here is one century milk fetch, and it's pretty big. Okay. Can you tell me how to use this thing? That's not going to work. Okay, and then you can see there are some other little gray ones here. So these are individual. There's a little sentry milk vetch, or maybe two there. This may be a separate one here. And so the mystery. So the mystery of this species is: um, does it cooperate and grow symbiotically with the rock mat? or does the rock map always dominate? And right now, um, the Arboretum at Flagstaff is also doing a lot of research on this plant, um, and they're doing experiments we're going to help them with this summer, doing clipping experiments on the rock map to see, is it always a competitor? Can it be a competitor or a nurse plant? Or how, what is the relationship of this plant to the century milk fetch? It's a lot faster growing than the little um, Calilopus that we want to work with, so we're thinking that it might actually kind of dominate and strangle out this plant, but you do see the individual seedlings germinating right in it. So it may just be a nice place that gives it a little moisture, a little organic material to grow in. Okay. 
Okay, there are also plants out there that are not supposed to be in the plant community. And over the past two years, we've begun to work with removing those from the habitat. And this is a really common weed in the park called Burr Buttercup. It's only a couple of inches tall and it's a little um, yellow flowering annual plant. It comes up pretty much with the snow melt. And usually it doesn't interfere with plants a lot, but since it's using water right at the time when the century milk fetch seedlings would be competing for the same water, we've started to remove it from the areas where the century milk fetch grows. There are also some animals that kind of frequent the areas where the century milk fetch is. Um, one of the things I've seen in the enclosure at Maricopa Point frequently are families of uh, mountain sheep. And um, there's usually a big father, a smaller, um, mature female, and one or two young mountain sheep. And um, a lot of times the dad is lying down and uh, everyone else is eating. And they eat right next to the century milk fetch, but I've never seen them do any damage to it. Um, the other creature that has been um, credited with potentially doing some damage to the species are the little ground squirrels. And um, the first year that I came to the park, there was um, about 150 out of about 400 plants were missing. There was a lot of digging, and the thought was that it may have been caused by um, ground squirrels. Um, but I tend to think it's the mountain sheep. I'll show you the digging, and maybe if there's a wildlife biologist, you can put in your two cents worth. Um, so this is a picture of the digging. And you can see there's a scraping. There's um, probably about three century milk veg plants there. They're kind of hard to distinguish. But you can see somebody's clawed right through the middle of that plant. Um, and I've seen the mountain sheep out there clawing, so I think it's mountain sheep. But um, someone who worked with the plant before me, called Crocker Bedford, really believed it was squirrels. And, and he didn't like it when I thought it was mountain sheep. So if anyone knows about digging habits of animals, I'd love to hear from you after the talk. Um, the elk have really come in, too, in about the past two years. I've talked to people who've worked with the species prior to that, and they would never see elk out on Hermit Road. Um, but this year, I've been out there when there have been 20 or 30 cows in there, um, especially early in the season when there's a lot of water and moisture and grass growing nearby. Um, they tend to make great big footprints. I've never seen them directly damage the plants. And it is possible that the disturbance of having them in there might create some depressions or something where century milk fish seeds grow and maybe get even a better place to grow than some of the surface where the seeds would have a hard time sticking. Um, there is one known predator, and we've just been seeing him this year because we're doing a seeding study, and we found um, one little um, caterpillar and he starts out looking very much like the caterpillar on the left there. Um, I've seen him get a little older now, and we're not for sure um, certain, but we think that he is the painted lady butterfly. And so I've watched him eat some of the seedlings I've planted, and also um, watched the caterpillar remove some leaves off of plants and shoots. So it sounds like this may be the first herbivore we've found for our plant after looking for several years. Um, So century milk fetch was first found in Grand Canyon. It was first recorded by Marcus Jones, who was a pretty famous botanist in 1903. And Marcus Jones said it was quite common, and he also, though, thought that it was another species. He called it Astragalus humilimus, which is a relative but a very different plant. Um, I think this one will work better. I'm not made for small microphones. Okay, so I'll talk into this one. So um, anyway, about 34 years later, actually 44 years later, Rupert Barnaby came along. Now Barnaby wrote the Bible on milk fetches, and he said two things. One, he said this is not a stragglers humilimus, you're totally wrong. And second, this plant is quite rare. And so, I don't know if something changed in 44 years, or if the plant did get a lot of impacts from development. It does grow right out on the rim between um, 
well, east of El Tabar or west of El Tabar, and only in those areas. And so it is possible that there could have been a lot at the turn of the century, and then 40 years later, there were fewer. But it's somewhat of a mystery.